Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Department of Energy Office of Legacy Management's 20-year anniversary podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Whalen, and I serve as the Museum Collection Specialist and Historian for RSI Entech, a contractor to the Office of Legacy Management, or LM. During this four-part podcast, we will discuss the past, present, and future of LM with key staff. This is part one, the history of legacy management. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Eric Boyle, a DOE historian. Welcome, Eric, and thanks for talking with me today. Thanks. It's great to be here. Looking forward to it. Good. Uh, so first, we're just going to get right into it. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you got started in the field of history? Sure. It's. I mean, it's kind of an unexpected, uh, long and winding road. It's <laughs> but, usually how it is, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, when I look back, I, I realize you know, for the longest time, uh, history was always something that was inherently interesting and fascinating to me. Um, but I never really thought of history as a, a career path growing up um, in high school and my early years uh, at junior college. I remember, you know, spending my first few years of taking classes after high school, feeling like I wanted to do and could do anything. I, I wanted to go to medical school. I wanted to be a marine biologist. I thought I'd be, a oh, maybe it'd be cool to be a, a psychologist or a, uh, no, I want to be a writer. Um, um, and historian w wasn't really something that I thought of as a career path. Um, and so uh, at the same time, I was also working in restaurants and got into management and uh, started running a restaurant uh, in my early 20s. And all of a sudden I started to feel like, well, maybe that's what I'm going to do with my life. I'll be a restaurateur and, and have my own business. And so I went down that path for a number of years and um, long story short, that didn't work out. Um, and so in my mid twenties, I found myself um, like reevaluating things. And I had, I had gone back to school while managing a restaurant in part, just because I needed something um, to distract me. I needed, a place to put my energy besides the restaurant. And so I had to choose a major um, when I re-enrolled at the local university. And I thought, well, you know, what do I really enjoy studying? Like, I don't care. Like, I'm not trying to study something so that I can get a, a job. I just want to take classes that I'm going to enjoy. And I thought, and well, not obviously, bored, yeah, right? and yeah. obviously the answer for me is history. So, so I chose the history major. And when things sort of fizzled out with me, uh, for me on the the restaurant path, um, I went to my advisor and I said, you know, look, how close am I to graduating? I, mean, I, I haven't been keeping track of this. <laughs> and they said, well, oh, you only have to take three more classes. And I thought, wow, that's great. So uh, I finished um, my class, my coursework and got my bachelor's degree in history. But then I was at another one of those impasses. You know, what do I do now? And um, I just happened to come across uh, an ad which was in the newspaper back in the day um, for uh, they were looking for people to work for AmeriCorps, um, the new domestic kind of Peace Corps program that had been relatively recently established. And they were looking for people um, to mentor teenagers um, in the area and, um, you know, paid minimum wage. But at the end of the year of service, you got an educational award. And I thought, oh, maybe that'll be like my path. I'll go to graduate school. And so I did that. And that's what ended up happening. So when I found myself at graduate school studying history, um, I still didn't really have a clear sense of where that was going to lead. Um, but this is where it's led. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't kidding when you said it was a winding road. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then how did you get started working as a DOE historian? If you, if you went restaurant, then you went AmeriCorps, like that's quite a jump to then go DOE. Yeah. So when I finished um, my PhD, it was in the history of science, technology, and medicine. And I was really more focused on the history of medicine end of things. So when I finished, um, I got a visiting assistant professorship at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, teaching for a year, which was incredible because it was one of the best history of medicine programs in the country. And then I had a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health uh, for three years after that, where I was working on a relatively new project that was only sort of tangentially related to what I had done for my dissertation, for my PhD. But there was a way to potentially bring those two things together. 
And that ended up um, resulting in my first book, which was on uh, the history of medical quackery. So it basically- Great name. Yeah. So <laughs> quack medicine, it's called. You can get it on Amazon. So um, just kidding. It's too expensive on, on Amazon. Maybe nice you can get a, plug there. a used yeah. copy. <laughs> so, uh, so when I was nearing the end of my fellowship, I was applying for jobs and, you know, was pretty well established on what I thought was going to be an academic path and thought I would eventually be a history professor. But when I was at the NIH, I learned about this whole world of historians who work for the federal government that I didn't even know existed before I came to the Washington, D.C. area. And so I started, you know, looking for job listings. And the big challenge at the time that I found was, you know, most places they were looking for some sort of subject matter expertise. So if you were going to get a job with the State Department, you needed to have studied diplomatic history. If you wanted a, a job with uh, the military, you had to have some sort of military history background. And I didn't have those things. And so I was somewhat limited in terms of what I could apply for. And then this job came up for an archivist position at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. And I thought, oh, history of medicine, that's, that's my in. Um, but it was an entry-level position as an archivist. I had never really received any official archivist training. Um, but I had been introduced to the world of archives when I was at the National Institutes of Health because part of my um, fellowship involved supporting the work that um, the Office of History's uh, archivist did at NIH. So I learned, you know, the basics of being an archivist. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that and my background in history of medicine will be enough to get me in the door. And um, I got the position. And um, after a couple of years, I ended up um, uh, being promoted to the uh, chief archivist at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. And it was great. You know, I, I was thoroughly enjoying the work that I was doing. It was very challenging. I learned a lot. I actually learned how to be an archivist, um, <laughs> mostly on the job. Um, but I also really missed um, being a historian. And there were some opportunities for me to do work um, related to the work that you would do as a historian at the museum. Um, but you know, as the chief archivist, clearly that wasn't my main right. job focus. So. I started selectively looking for uh, positions, and when the DOE job came up, um, it just seemed like it was ideally suited for me in a number of ways. They were looking for somebody who had a history um, background, like at least in the area of the history of science and technology, which I did, um, some familiarity with the kind of long history of DOE dating back to World War II, um, which I had been exposed to as a grad student. Uh, they were looking for somebody who had um, had published a book and somebody who had archives experience. And so I thought, well, you know, I'll throw my hat in the ring and see what happens. And um, and I ended up getting the position. And, you know, after I, I got the job, I remember, you know, every time somebody would ask me, hey, how's your how's, how's your job? How's your new job? I would say, this is my dream job. I don't know how it happened, but I got my dream job. I'm mm -hmm. going to do this for the rest of my life. So it was very exciting. Did they also want someone who had managed a restaurant in their 20s? They that... didn't say that, no. but, <laughs> but it, it actually did come up in the in the interview. Um, and Perfect. They, yeah, and they said, you know, that we also like, you know, like someone who has that kind of real real world experience would also be great too. So, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that never happens. Yeah. <laughs> So as DOE historian, what are some of the responsibilities that you have to do on a daily basis? So what does a, a day in the life of Eric Boyle look like? Well, the, one of the things that I really enjoy about my job is that there are a lot of different things that I do, um, and and they're pretty diverse things. Um, re I, really, I tell people that my work falls into three main categories. Um, the first category is work that I do that, that you would think that, that a historian does. So I... I'm the the resource for person uh, people who have any questions about DOE history. So I get, um, on average, over 150 inquiries a year from people across the spectrum, from universities to people looking for information about their grandpa who worked on the Manhattan Project to um, people researchers who are you know write, writing a book about. Uh, a particular aspect of, that overlaps with DOE hist history from decades past to 
people in other federal agencies, um, people within DOE who are looking for information about the history of their program or their office. Um, and so there's a lot of research and kind of detective work that's involved with that. And it's it's a really rewarding part of my job because I get to engage with people. And it really feels like, you know, at the end of the interaction, like I've helped somebody. Right, I've yeah. done something, which is great, which, you know, isn't always easy to measure as a historian. Um, and I, you know, maintain uh, the DOE uh, history web pages and, you know, post some content on there. Um, I'm a facilitator in a lot of ways. I do I do my own research um, when I have the time and space to do that, which um, isn't um, often. But um, I also, you know, do do some uh, research and writing of DOE history as, as well. So that's one aspect of my job. Uh, the other aspect of my job um, involves archives. Um, so when I started at, at DOE in 2016, um, I learned that the situation in the archives um, out in Germantown, Maryland, where most of the sort of headquarters archives had been housed for decades, uh, was, uh, to be polite, less than ideal. Isn't that always how it goes? Yes. I mean, historians had been running the show yeah. for decades, and they don't know how to be right, archivists. Right. So, uh, so there was a lot of um, effort just involved with getting the house in order, getting things cataloged, making sure everything's labeled. Um, so a uh, lot of legwork. Yeah, a lot yeah. of legwork. Um, and it was, you know, the work of an archivist was something that I had done uh, for a number of years before that. So it was it was very second nature work for me. Um, and it was work that I enjoyed. And um, and it, you know, it, it, it also very regularly and clearly paid dividends. Whereas, you know, when I started, I'd get an inquiry from someone saying, you know, I'm interested in finding out, uh, you know, what you have about what information you have about the work that the Atomic Energy Commission did with um, Spain in the 1960s. And I would think, well, how in the heck do I figure this out? And so I would, you know, search the database and I would find the boxes that, you know, had Spain in the title, but then finding the boxes would take me half an hour. So after we had everything in order and things more effectively cataloged, an inquiry like that could be, I could answer it and and provide the person the information that they were seeking in you know, a, a tenth of the time, time that it took previously. Um, and a lot of that work out in Germantown also involved organizing what I refer to as the DOE reference collection. So we, we, in, we inherited, um, a lot of material from other programs and offices from the old DOE library over the years. And a lot of that uh, uh, material also wasn't cataloged. It was on the shelves. Um, and the DOE historian uh, before me who was out in Germantown, he was out there for 35 years. And so he knew where, where everything was. If you went to uh, uh, Terry Fainer was his name. If you went to Terry and you said, hey, Terry, I'm looking for um, the uh, report on the uh, the uh, test of the atomic bomb at, um, at uh, Frenchman Flats in 1956. He's, oh, it's over here. It's on this shelf. Well, I'll take you right there. Well, if, you know, the new guy on the block, I had no idea how to right. find that stuff. So there was a lot of work just kind of catal cataloging information and getting a handle on that. Um, and that work has continued. Um, the third area of work that I do is in the area of historic preservation. So when I started, um, I was the federal preservation officer. So I was responsible for coordinating um, all of the work that was done in the area of historic preservation across the entire DOE complex, which in and of itself is a monumental task. Um, um, and, and in a lot of ways, it was very challenging because that was the area of my work that I knew the least about. Um, but it was also incredibly interesting. and. Um, uh, was really an opportunity for me to um, engage with people and travel to sites and um, really f kind of collaboratively face challenges um, that uh, were difficult um, but were, were rewarding um, in the process. Um, I'm now Deputy Fe Federal Pre Preservation Officer, so I continue to, to support the work that's done in the area of historic preservation. Um, and that's uh, uh, a very enjoyable and rewarding part of my, my job as well.
I liked how you said that uh, work in history is a lot like detective work because that's exactly how it is. You are trying to find the clues to put together the story, and I think that is a great way to describe it. It sounds like that's a lot of what your job has been so far and creating the story and obviously has made you very knowledgeable in the history of DOE. So we are going to take a quick break, and then we are going to move on and start talking about the history of DOE and LM. For more information on LM's programs, check out our webpage at energy.gov LM and click on programs. So this is going to be a little bit of a tough ask because I'm asking you about 90s years worth, <laughs> 90 years worth of history. But can you briefly talk about DOE's history before LM was created? Um. Well, historians can't briefly talk about it, I, I so that, that may be the big lesson of today's <laughs> uh, discussion. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's it's a question, you know, when I get a question like that, I think, well, you know, most of the time it takes me 45 minutes to give a good DOE history presentation. I do have a 20-minute version, so let's see if I can come up with a five-minute <laughs> yeah. version, so let, we'll see what I can do. Um, I mean, really, the the great thing about the Office of Legacy Management for a historian is the origins of the office really are clearly um, traced back to the origins of the department. And that's with the Manhattan Project. So with the Manhattan Project, um, you had an unprecedented scientific, technological, industrial endeavor, uh, the likes of which no one had seen before that involved dozens of sites all over the country. Um, some were involved with uranium mining and milling and storing and processing. Um, you had uh, universities and laboratories that were um, developing the science behind developing uh, an atomic weapon. You had the three major sites um, of the Manhattan Project uh, at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Hanford, Washington. So the scale of work being done um, on the Manhattan Project was enormous. And each of those sites had various legacies associated with it, many of which are tied to the work that, um, that LM does uh, to this day. So after the war, you had this huge apparatus that had been created for the almost exclusive purpose of, of designing and testing and um, successfully using an atomic weapon. And no one was exactly sure what was going to be done with it. So the Atomic Energy Commission was created to continue the work that had been done on the Manhattan Project. And it was a civilian-run organization, even though its primary objective was to build more and bigger bombs. Um, and that was in large part because the United States transitioned almost immediately from World War II to the Cold War. And the Cold War um, was epitomized by this arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. So what was already an incredibly vast um, network of sites involved in the Manhattan Project um, became even more um, uh, massive and complicated in some ways during those early years in the 1940s and 1950s as the weapons complex was ramped up and eventually topped over 100 sites in 35 different states. So at the same time, um, the Atomic Energy Commission was also expanding into what historians have commonly referred to as peaceful uses of atomic weapons. Kind of an oxymoron. Uh, yeah, and, uh, or, or uh, atomic research more broadly. So how is it that we can take the knowledge that was behind um, the creation of a bomb and use it in other, other ways, in other fields? So the Atomic Energy Commission was huge in developing, for example, um, the capacity to generate electricity uh, with nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. And they d had a whole pro um, variety of programs that were developed to these, uh, directed in these areas of peaceful uses, some of which uh, were focused on um, uh, science, the developing of um, particle accelerators and um, there was a period in time when they were testing uh, nuclear explosives for peaceful purposes like excavation. So you could use it in mining natural gas and oil, mm -hmm. for example, or if you needed to build a canal, what easier way to build a canal than set off a bomb? Right. Um, so, <laughs> so needless to say, there were some problems that uh, ended up coming out of that and that program didn't last long. But 
that kind of work was also done, and the legacies associated with it uh, would have eventually have to be um, addressed. So by the time we get to the 1970s, with the creation of the Department of Energy, you have over 40 years of weapons development and work done in this area of uh, nuclear energy and science. And that has resulted in millions of tons of radioactive liquid waste, millions of cubic yards of radioactive solid waste, um, thousands of tons of spent fuel and what were referred to um, innocuously as special materials associated with work done in that space. And then you also had um, countless amounts of contaminated soil and water as well around sites where this work was done. So the problem was the, the Atomic Energy Commission for its first few years of or first few decades of operation was largely self-regulated um, in the space of waste management in particular. And that was in no small part because the work that was being done was highly classified. It was very sensitive. You couldn't just open up a site for regulators to come in. You did the work yourself. You did the best job you could. Um, but the priorities for the Atomic Energy Commission during those decades were um, first and foremost production. You had to produce weapons and there was a driver. There was the Cold War. It wasn't, eh, we'll just see what we can, we'll set a target and see, maybe we'll reach it, maybe we won't. So because your, your driver is production, the priorities related to that driver end up being, end up taking precedence. So things like safety and security, for example, took precedence over waste management. Sure. So that doesn't really change um, until the 1980s. Um, it changes a little bit with the creation of DOE, um, but then there's, and that's partly because you, um, the country is in a period of detente with the Soviet Union. And so there is talk of kind of standing down some of these production facilities, but then things ramp up again when Reagan comes into office and the tensions of the Cold War are heightened. But then by the mid 1980s, you really start to see a shift. And there are a few different factors that are involved there. Uh, first is there's been a, a kind of steadily changing regulatory environment. So there's more and more regulatory requirements that the DOE is running up against that previously the Atomic Energy Commission just was said, ah, oh, trust us, we're doing our best. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. We can't talk to you about these things. Well, DOE was making an effort to be more transparent and more cooperative um, and engage with those secrecy. to get rid of the secrecy. Um, and Secondly, there were increasing public calls for action. People oftentimes at these sites or near these sites saying, look, what are you guys doing? These places need to be cleaned up. Something has to happen here. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, the other major factor is the Cold War comes to an end. So with the end of the Cold War, there's an end of production in that space of nuclear weapons. And so there's no longer that push that had been there for decades. And so you have people who had been working um, for decades in that space and funding that had been directed at that work for decades um, that could be potentially put elsewhere. And so um, in 1989, DOE stands up what would eventually be called the Office of Environmental Management. And it's with the creation of um, the Office of environmental management that really this cleanup challenge is directly faced. And the initial effort is primarily um, just trying to get a clear sense of what need, needs to be done and figuring out how are we going to do this? You know, how do you create the infrastructure and the processes and the storage facilities? And it's a huge task. It's it ends up eventually becoming the biggest environmental cleanup effort in wow. the world. And so it's a massive effort mm -hmm. and it's a massive undertaking. So what was the nexus then to then go on and create legacy management? So the Office of Environmental Management is handling all of this. So what did, why did we decide that legacy management was necessary? 
Right. So when work finally starts being done in the 1990s, um, there's a growing realization that even after um, the cleanup of all these Manhattan Project era and Cold War era um, sites is completed, um, in many cases, there is going to be a need for a long-term um, presence at those sites to manage them. And that's largely because some of the remedies that um, the EM had come up with needed to be monitored and maintained. And, um, uh, uh, and EM wasn't equipped to do that work um, in the way that it had been organized. And so um, if you have things like disposal cells and groundwater um, treatment systems and institutional controls that need to be monitored indefinitely, um, it made sense increasingly to people at DOE that an office devoted to that work um, should be stood up. And so LM was established to provide that nationwide um, institutional capability for long-term um, management of the sites that had been closed and cleaned up and were no longer supporting uh, a, a DOE mission. To go back a little bit, so production of these materials ramped up very quickly with World War II and into the Cold War. Was cleanup and monitoring as quick as the production or was it more of a slow-going process? Well, once, it, once DOE commits to it in 1989 with the creation of EM, the the action that was taken was immediate. And the if you look at the budget um, of DOE, for example, which is also always a, a great indicator to what a, what is this agency doing? In the early 1990s, uh, cleanup was a third of the DOE's budget, wow. and so they were pouring in an enormous amount of resources. Um, at its peak, I think. Um, EM had over 20,000 people working for them on cleanup. So it was, uh, it was, action was quick, uh, quickly taken. That said, it, you know, there were part of the pro part of the, the difficulty that EM faced was figuring out how you approach this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. If you have over a hundred sites, how do you prioritize things? What do you do first? Um, what um triage kind right of, yeah. yeah how do you triage the situation and so um by 2003 when um lm begins operations um doe had already completed cleanup at um about 2000 or two dozen rather um former uh, uranium mills it had completed cleanup at a number of sites that uh, were um, associated with the Manhattan Project and the early work of the Atomic Energy Commission. And so they had sites that um, were, were, uh, where the mission, essentially from EM's perspective, um, had been completed. And so it made sense to turn them over to, uh, to LM. Um, and so by the time LM is, is established, DOE had been working on how to approach this whole um, effort associated with long-term maintenance and surveillance because this wasn't something that they had ever had to do before. Um, and so LM and EM um, had a very collaborative relationship in those early years in figuring out how to do that. How was it that EM was gonna do their work in a way that made it easier for LM to do their job and vice versa. Um, uh, and so the, 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 Standing up of LM in many ways, I think, made the work that EM was uh, was doing, which was already a monumentally difficult task, maybe a little bit easier. Right. Yeah, they had an end goal that they right. went with and then a fluid transition. Right. All right, we are going to take another quick break and then we'll continue talking about LM history. For more information on LM sites, check out our webpage at energy.gov slash LM and click on sites. We've talked about how LM started in 2003 and its transition from EM. Can you describe a little bit about how it's evolved since 2003? Sure. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting about LM is if you look at the mission, uh, the mission has largely remained the same for the past 20 years. Um, the scope of work being done 
has certainly increased dramatically over the years. Um, LM has grown from 33 sites its first year to over 100 sites today. There are more sites uh, in, in the pipeline coming in the next five years. Um, but in terms of the major goals, those major goals um, are still part of LM's uh, uh, list of major goals. The, the major, um, the one significant addition has been the uh, addition of the goal um, to engage um, governments, stakeholders, um, and uh, the people at the sites um, in a more kind of coordinated and conscientious uh, fashion. And, and so the initial five main goals of LM included uh, protecting human health and the environment, uh, preserving, protecting, and sharing records and information, uh, meeting commitments to the contractor workforce, the firm, former DOE and Atomic Energy Commission workforce, um, optimizing the use of land and assets, and sustaining management excellence. And those four main goals are still there. Um, LM has, has the work that it's done in each of those areas has evolved, uh, certainly. Um, it, LM has pioneered, for example, the development of innovative approaches to protecting health and human environment at the sites, developing um, new strategies for um, ensuring that people's safety and um, the environment are maintained uh, over long periods of time. Um, LM is also engaged increasingly at an international, international level, helping countries that are facing similar problems um, face those problems more effectively moving forward, uh, which is uh, also significant. Um, when LM started, uh, the records, on the records end, end of things, records for the sites were uh, spread at storage facilities across the country. Um, most of them were National Archive storage facilities. Um, and so using those records uh, was um, extremely difficult. Um, with LM um, and the ability to stand up uh, a repository for those records out in Morgantown, which is a state-of-the-art facility, um, has changed the whole world of records and access to those records. Uh, millions of pages have been digitized. Um, thousands of requests for information from those records have been answered and information has been provided to people. Um, and that, that work um, uh, is ongoing. Um, LM is also increasingly focused on sustainable management at sites and in particular on beneficial reuse. So um, you can look across the country and see examples of ways in which uh, LM has uh, made significant inroads on reusing sites that were previously just sitting there. Mm -hmm. No one was doing anything with them. There's parks, there are wildlife refuges, there are um, uh, grazing lands, solar farms, all sorts of different reuses. Um, and LM has also, I think, dramatically expanded its work that it's done in the area of um, public and stakeholder engagement. And it's done that in a number of different ways. Um, a few of those include the work that it um, does with the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, um, which is co-managed with the National Park Service. Um, it does, LM is doing amazing things in the area of STEM education. Um, LM is doing great things at it, its uh, award-winning uh, interpretive centers. So I think the amount of work that is being done now compared to the amount of work that was being done 20 years ago is in incomparable. Mm -hmm. um, um, even though the mission, the essential mission, the essential goals, I think, have have um, largely stayed the same. And just grown yep. on that and what they can do with that. Mm -hmm. You brought up the mission. And so Ellum's mission statement is to fulfill the Department of Energy's post-closure responsibilities and ensure the future protection of human health and the environment. So how does studying history then support that mission? That's a good question. Um, I mean, history can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, I think the most common temptation is to use history as a kind of lessons learned tool. So you want to look at how things were done in the past and figure out 
how things were done effectively or ineffectively, and then use those lessons um, to inform the decisions that you're making today, um, which I think oftentimes can work and, and uh, is helpful. The problem with that approach oftentimes is that this the, the situation um, and the circumstances under which things happened in the past are almost certainly going to be dramatically different than they are now. So to think that a solution that worked 20 or 30 years ago is going to work now because it worked before, eh, it might not be the case. Um, and there, I think there can, I think history can also be misused in some ways um, uh, with that perspective as well, because it can be used to look for solutions in the past that fit the challenges that you're facing today in a way that ends up resulting in you sort of selectively choosing the things that fit what you've already decided is going to work or right. not work. So it's a it's a it's a tricky a little uh, bit of a slippery slope yeah, there. Yeah, um, I think there's also a way in which history can be used to push back against um, another way that it is common commonly used that's problematic, and that is. Um, what I refer to as a kind of hero and villains approach to history, oh, where you know there's a temptation, I think, is in, in particular in the media um, to um, use history as a way to assign blame um, or use history to celebrate um, accomplishments or celebrate people in a way that doesn't necessarily um, uh, effectively tell the story of what happened. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for LM um, to, uh, to flesh out a more complete story um, in places where that temptation uh, has been out there um, or has manifested itself. Um, I tell my, my students on the last day um, of class every semester when I was teaching that there's a third way that history can be used. And that's the way that I want them to use history. And that is essentially to use history to more effectively understand who we are and how we got here. So no one would expect, for example, to understand how an individual is who they are without understanding their backstory, right. where they grew up, where they went to school, the friends they had, the major influences in their life. You can't understand somebody without understanding their past. You can't understand an agency without understanding its past. Um, but that's also sometimes a, a tricky process. Um, I, I tell my students, you know, my goal for you in part is to try to understand that, try to use a study, the study of the past to better understand how oftentimes in the present we have blinders on. We don't see or understand our own preconceptions or misperceptions or skewed priorities because we're in it. Mm -hmm. We're in the present. We can't see it. How right. can you see it? You're in it. When you study the past, it's an opportunity for you to look back and say, oh, what was happening in the 1940s? Mm -hmm. What was going on? Why did they make those choices? Well, there were these immediate factors that they were probably considering, but there was also this that maybe they weren't. And so you complicate it. You are empathic. You try to understand. Um, and so that's productive on, um, on multiple levels. Um, you understand more clearly where you came from and you understand, you try to understand it on terms that are um, generous and, and built on that desire to understand, but you also understand your present uh, more effectively too. So with LM, I mean, LM is unique in that its primary responsibility is to work with the past, with sites, um, most of which are tied to the World War II and the Cold War. And so a more robust, thoughtful, conscientious understanding of that history will without question, I think, pay dividends for the organization in terms of meeting its mission. Right. Well, and it's aptly named as legacy management. Uh, I 
I think it's interesting how a lot of times history is kind of equated to fact and, you know, for most people and getting different perspectives is very helpful in understanding the past, like you said. And one of the things that we were able to work on together last year was an oral history project where we were able to uh, work with people who had been in DOE from the beginning or from its early stages and talk to them about their personal experience. Can you talk about why it's so important to get these primary sources and get their perspective on history and how that impacts the overall story that we get? Sure. I mean, for a historian, you can't do your work without sources. Um, You have to have the source information to work from in order to engage in that that part of the work that you were referring to, and that is interpretation. You know, all historians interpret their sources to tell a story about what happened. Um, and it's important, it's particularly important to have those firsthand accounts of what happened and the perspectives of the people who were involved in things in the past, because oftentimes you can't have a clear and full understanding of what happened based on exclusively on the documentary record, Mm -hmm. Um, what is in the archives, what's in um, uh, people's filing cabinets, you know, what was published. Um, Those firsthand accounts are enormously valuable and particularly uh, helpful, I think, for LM in a number of ways. You know, first and foremost, as you alluded to, getting an understanding of what um, people understand uh, experienced at the sites that LM is now responsible for managing now, but also um, learning from the experience of people who um, were uh, part of the pioneering effort uh, undertaken by LM in the early 2000s. People who did the work that people continue to do today. Uh, I think those oftentimes are the best people to learn from. When I started as DOE historian, the only way I was able to do a lot of what I did and the only way that I'm able to do much of the work that I do now was I worked with the outgoing chief historian, uh, Terry Fainer, who I will forever owe a debt of gratitude to. Um, He worked in phased retirement with me for over two years. And he had, like I mentioned earlier, had over three decades of experience that I was able to learn from. Um, And so being able to learn from people and the experiences that they had in the form of uh, oral histories, I think is invaluable. Totally agree. So we've talked a lot about different stages of DOE history, LM history, and uh, I think this is one of the most interesting questions. And what do you find the most interesting about LM history? Is there a little factoid or something that you just think is just the most interesting thing to learn about? You know, I think the most interesting thing for me still about DOE history is uh, the story of the Manhattan Project. And I remember um, as a fairly new to the agency historian uh, attending a conference where um, my colleague, our colleague in LM, Patrick Benson, was giving a talk on the history of LM. And he was able to kind of masterfully paint this portrait of what happened at the time that connected the work that was being done on the Manhattan Project from the mining of the uranium to its processing, to its machining, to its uh, refabricating and enriching and how you got from the ore to the bomb in a way that was tied to the sites where that work was done and then in turn was tied to the sites that LM manages today that just made everything come into focus in a way for me that it had not before. And the, that history is so rich and so complicated um, that it's one of those things, it's one of those subjects for me that I think makes history such a great thing um, to study. And that is, I will never come close to learning everything about the Manhattan Project. I will always be able to learn something new. 
Um, I learn something new on a regular basis, just doing my job, trying to answer questions to people uh, that, that come across my desk. And I think um, that for me is one of the um, more exciting things about the work that I do um, and makes me happy that I will be able to continue that. It's never boring being a historian it's when not. you're interested in it. Yeah, the Manhattan Project is so interesting because there's so many social, economical, uh, political things that go into it. And it's, yeah, you'll never totally know the entire full story. Uh, do you have any other tidbits or key information that you want our listeners to know or before we close out? Um, I would just say... There are uh, a ton of resources out there if you are interested in learning more about DOE and LM history. Um, LM uh, has a number of its own histories that it has um, uh, put together dating back to its creation in 2003. There's, a, I think, a five-year, a 10-year, a 15-year, and an annual historical summary that's been completed for the last several years. Um, I think there's a 20-year history on the horizon. <laughs> um, there's also a number of history resources that are part of the larger DOE history web pages. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, um, there are um, links to DOE site histories, timelines, um, past histories that have been written by historians, um, links to old historical photographs, which are awesome. Uh, there's a ton of stuff out there, so I'd encourage you to uh, poke around on those pages. And by all means, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, and I'd be happy to do my best to answer them. <laughs> Add to all the requests you're getting. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric, for talking with me today. I know I really enjoyed learning more about LM history, and I'm sure our listeners will. This concludes part one of the Office of Legacy Management's 20-year anniversary podcast, The History of LM. Stay tuned for episode two with Tanya Smith-Taylor, Technical Director for Long-Term Stewardship, where we discuss LM's programs and sites.